Hello, hello. Welcome back to Peak Northwest, an outdoors and travel podcast by The Oregonian and Oregon Live, dedicated to the adventure and exploration of our beautiful Pacific Northwest. I'm Jamie Hale. And I'm Vicki Connor. Together, we take you to some of the most beautiful and interesting destinations in our region, discussing where to go, what to do, and places to see. And today, we're talking about a piano performance that takes place in various beautiful and scenic outdoor locations that is in a landscape, which, Jamie, you and I were able to experience during our trip just a couple of weeks ago at Wallowa Lake State Park. That's right, Vicki. This is my first time seeing in a landscape, which has been going on for a few years around Oregon and um, some of the other areas in the West here. And it was really just an incredible experience that was really just like the, the cherry on top of an already really beautiful day out there in Northeast Oregon. So in a landscape has been around since 2016, and it is the, the brainchild of a local pianist Hunter Nowak, who performs classical music on a grand piano in various outdoor locations. So thinking the desert, the mountains, the coast, you know, Portland, the Willamette Valley, you name it. It's really a, a one of a kind experience. So during our trip to Joseph and Malawa Lake, we kind of stumbled upon in a landscape and it was so serendipitous because uh, one of our coworkers actually produced a full video about um, Hunter and in a landscape and all the different places that he's performed. And, uh, it was just such an incredible experience on an already amazing trip. And I'm so glad we got to experience it. Yeah. I was kind of kicking myself for not knowing it was going on there before we left. Cause I do all this research ahead of time for a trip and we were headed to Joseph. I thought I had done my due diligence and we get into town and a friend of mine who lives there texted me and said, oh, by the way, do you know about this event going on at Wallawa Lake? And I said, no, but we absolutely have to go. This looks too cool. <laughs> we can't miss this opportunity. Yeah, it was just so wonderful. The whole thing took place uh, kind of right at sunset. And to see the lake in the background and Hunter playing in the foreground, it was absolutely breathtaking. Truly a magical experience. And um, today we're going to talk a little bit more about that magical experience and some of the other in a landscape performances with none other than Hunter Nowak himself, who is joining us uh, on the podcast in the road. Hunter, thanks so much for taking the time to talk to us. Thank you so much for having me. Happy to be here. So Hunter, tell us how in a landscape got started. Sure. I had finished my master's in London. While I was in London, I met my partner, Thomas Lauderdale, who um, kind of tricked me into moving to Oregon. And so I was in Oregon, where I grew up, I was born in Newport and grew up in Central Oregon. And um, just kind of fell back in love with the outdoors. Uh, I grew up hunting and backpacking and fishing. And so just being back outside, I remembered how much I love being outside and how important it is <laughs> to spend time outside. You know, I had a master's, but there aren't a lot of opportunities for graduates with degrees in piano performance. So you can sort of either become a teacher or you can try to do competitions. But I had been interested in kind of collaborative cross arts uh, work in college and had done a few different shows bringing together theater and music. And so when I was uh, back in Oregon, I had actually heard about this opera show down in Los Angeles called Invisible Cities, where they took over Union Station, the train station downtown LA, and they had a full orchestra in one area and singers mic'd up going all over the station. And it was like an immersive play where the audience had wireless headphones so they could hear the whole, all of the musicians mixed perfectly together in their headsets, and they could choose where they wanted to go. So they could sit in the middle of the station, watch the play happen, they could follow specific characters throughout. And I thought this is, you know, such a brilliant idea. And it's the first time I'd heard of a classical, like a really high level classical performance being taken out of a space that was specifically and acoustically designed for classical music. I wanted to try doing that. But instead of using Union Station, use all of the magical landscapes uh, as sets here in the Pacific Northwest. So I applied for a grant from Regional Arts and Culture Council to produce a few shows in Washington, Clackamas, and Multnomah County. And really the kind of ethos behind the project 
when it started that still continues today is inspired by the WPA, the Works Progress Administration, which during the Great Depression of the 1930s through their federal music and theater projects uh, presented thousands of free concerts and plays, a lot of them in public lands. And I really liked that with the government program, the arts were kind of seen to be as important to the overall health of a society as our roads and our post offices, and also that it kind of brought the fine arts out of the spaces that some people feel are elitist or unapproachable in some way, and brought them into these spaces that are a little bit more neighborly. We ended up doing nine shows the first year at WPA sites like Timberline Lodge and other you know state parks like Tryon Creek, um, and it was just kind of a big hit. People loved to be able to have the so we use the wireless headphone technology so they can hear the classical music but then wander through the landscape and so the music becomes more of a soundtrack to their experience in a landscape it's such a great idea i think it's when when you see that this is this is what you're doing and you hear about it it just i think it, it it's so it seems almost so obvious and yet something that i feel like no one has really thought of before um, which is a sign of a really great idea and one of the things that immediately pops up, one of the first questions I, I think that a lot of people probably have that I had was, I mean, when you take a, a pianist and you take a piano out of the concert hall into a natural environment, um, I, I imagine there's all sorts of challenges, logistical challenges, environmental challenges that come with that. I've seen you um, be playing in the snow, playing in the heat, playing on the, you know, the, the, the on the coast and in the salt, you know, salt water air and uh, all these different places. What what are the challenges that do come up for you in playing in these different kinds of environments? It's a good question. The very first year we rented pianos uh, from the local Steinway dealer, and that worked really well. But then when the next year when I wanted to bring the piano to like the Alvord Desert and the top of Mount Bachelor, you know, he was like, Hunter, I love this project, but we just can't take that that risk uh, because it is a risk putting, you know, a, a new Steinway Model D is around a quarter of a million dollars. They're, they're really remarkable, um, fine machines and they're very expensive. So we had this kind of challenge after the first year of like wanting to go to these more extreme locations, but not having, um, kind of a piano to do that. And I really wanted the same piano that's in Carnegie hall, nine foot Steinway. Um, and so I went to Jordan Schnitzer and he believed in the project and saw the vision. And so, uh, he said, yeah, Hunter, you know, find the piano. And so I found this 1912, uh, model D nine foot Steinway at the apostolic faith church right here in Portland. And, um, you know, it was an older piano, uh, 1912. So it's, it's been around the block, <laughs> you know, and when we first tested it that first year, I really didn't know if it was going to make it, you know, we designed our own way of moving it, uh, where it stays on the trailer, uh, and travels on its belly. Um, the first year I had these really kind of funny, like foot pump, hydraulic pumps. And then I, we makeshifted almost like a kind of a weird mattress to go underneath the piano to protect it from <laughs> the road bumps, uh, and the washboard, you know, dirt roads. Um, and the, you know, the first, the, I guess, 2017, we took it, you know, all over the state and, you know, we we're in over a hundred degrees in Fort Rock. And then the next day on the Oregon coast in like cold, you know, 40 degrees and foggy and the piano just like it, it delivered and it gets out of tune every, every show, but we either travel with a piano technician or have somebody local work on it before every show, you know, we've done now about 175 shows with this piano. And, you know, I, I sort of a, a, amazes me. I think it's a testament to Steinway to the how these pianos are built. Mm -hmm. um, and to the technicians that have worked on it. Um, Marshall Anderson actually rebuilt our piano with uh, Wessel Nickel and Gross action. Um, so like the, the tiny little parts inside that basically go from the key to the hammer that strikes the string are now all like plastic and synthetic carbon fiber parts, which are much more resilient to dramatic changes in temperature and humidity. It still kind of blows my mind. I think the uh, last year during the heat dome, we were in Eastern Oregon and it got up to about 117 degrees where we were. And, Oof. and our piano technician was like, you know, I just called my uh, mentor and 
the piano glue melts at 123 degrees. <laughs> oh my <laughs> <It's> like, gosh. <laughs> <"Uh-oh."> <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, it, it stayed together. And um, so basically what, I mean, the short answer to your question is um, it starts out with just being a really amazing machine. I think if it were a smaller piano, it wouldn't be quite as resilient. Um, these this nine foot Steinways have just like, they're built like tanks and they were really designed to be touring, um, not necessarily on the back of a truck, a uh, pickup flatbed, but um, you know, they were designed to be touring. And then I think the second part is we just try to take as good a care, to, care of it as we can. Uh, and then know that, you know, it's getting treated a little bit more, it's been put in more difficult challenges than it's probably expected to. And so we just kind of build in more maintenance um, along the way. Wow. That is so incredible. Andre, I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about the experience of the performances. What what should people kind of expect when they go and see you play? So what we do is we bring this, you know, piano on a tra- trailer that transforms into a stage into a beautiful place. And so a lot of these places are national parks or state parks or ranches, farms. Essentially, I think like the criteria for me is a landscape that's inspiring. And so sometimes they're kind of more epic and famous sites like Crater Lake National Park. Other times they're more intimate and kind of almost like neighborhood spots. They might be a county park. I love to see out in the audience a mix of people. Um, We play mostly in rural areas. We give a lot of um, free tickets away to those that are from the communities in which we're performing. I think one of the first things that people notice is that there are in the audience people that you definitely that you might not expect to see at a classical piano concert. And so you check in, you know, you can wear whatever you want. People bring picnics, they bring their own uh, folding chairs or blankets. Sometimes we're like, you know, on top of Mount Bachelor in, in the rocks. And so, you you know, you bring stuff to sit kind of in the rocks and other times we're on like very comfortable lawns but then i i play for about an hour 15 hour and 30 minutes sometimes having guest artists like uh this amazing native american flute player james edmund greeley uh have poets have dancers have other kinds of musicians and i talk between each piece it's very informal and i like to encourage people mostly to connect with the landscape Say if we're by a lake or a river, I might play Ravel's Ondine or Debussy's Reflections in the Water and have people actually stick their toes in the water or go sit, you know, and watch the reflections in the water. Other times there's a story that's connected to the music, but not connected to the landscape. So there are just kind of maybe different prompts or things that I say before each piece that hopefully give people a feeling like of comfort and like they can let their imagination go they can wander if they want to, they can lay down and stare at the clouds or even close their eyes and doze off if that makes sense for them. Or you can like run around and climb a tree. Uh, There are a lot of people that like to just kind of gather around the piano and watch me, which I, you know, I think is great too. And almost all of the shows will invite people up for a couple songs to physically lie under the piano. So they get kind of a different perspective uh, and experience with the sound Um, But really, it's kind of, it's very open ended. And um, my hope is that people find little moments of magic in the landscape and connect with nature, connect with the music, and maybe connect with the other people that are also kind of sharing that experience together. It's in a way such a radical approach for classical music, right? I mean, it's so different than most, uh, most people are used to approaching and experiencing uh, this kind of music. And yet at the same time, speaking from my own experience, having seen the performance at Wallawa Lake, it seems so natural. Um, and so normal to be wandering around a natural landscape or, you know, lying on the grass and staring up at the clouds. Uh, you know, it, there's, so I, I, I'm just wondering about, you know, what do you make of that sort of that, that dissonance right there? You know, I think we have maybe through film or, um, I think we all have this most of us have some relationship with classical music as kind of a background noise to, to, a, to, I mean, to a movie, for example, where we we're comfortable and we're familiar with letting music kind of guide our emotions. But one of the things with classical 
Like if you go see a classical performance in a hall, unless there's like a conductor that's doing a lot of movement or a performer that's that's particularly interesting to watch, it's not the most visually stimulating experience. And um, so you the kind of the way into a classical concert into that music is either if you know a lot about it or you've you know have experience with it in the past or you know maybe that you go like go to a lecture recital or read about it in the program notes um but i think with like when you just put the music and that concert experience outdoors and like having the ever changing landscape like that's so infinitely complex you know like the infinite complexity of being in in nature and the changing light and like if a breeze comes in or a flock of geese flies by or you see a little you know spider crawling through the grass it's there's something so immediate uh, about it that makes your it like keeps your senses more alert listening to this incredible music like this music that we that's kind of stood the test of time um and is like is somehow healing and nourishing putting it in that context i agree that like you know they say it seems so simple and and in some ways like a, a natural fit and yet it's not been done and it just feels so uh so lucky to be able to be doing this and not to be doing it alone but like to be doing it in community and having these you know people come from all over to like experience these places and experience the music and about a third of our audience has never been to a classical music concert before. And so there are a lot of first time first timers with this music and a lot of the feedback that I get is like, you know, I didn't I probably wouldn't have come to a, a piano concert. Um but you know, I'm I love nature or I uh I love this place. And so and your music has given me a different lens through which to to be here, which is uh really inspiring feedback and makes me want to keep keep going. Yeah, Hunter, I can say that I've literally just never experienced something like your performance. And as you were saying, like when I was wearing the headphones and just kind of walking around, it did feel like I was in a movie and it, mm. I was just walking through a scene or something. So uh, it was just, it lended for a lot of introspection and um, contemplation, which I really enjoyed. That's awesome to hear. Uh, well, we're going to take a short break, but when we return, we'll talk more with Hunter about places he'd like to play in the future and as well as some of his favorite things to do in the Pacific Northwest. And we are back with Hunter Nowak, and we are talking about In a Landscape. We just spoke with Hunter about kind of the background, about these performances, what has inspired him, how he chooses what music to play. Hunter, I'm interested in learning what locations you're looking forward to playing coming up. One of my favorite places that we're going back to again this year is the top of Mount Bachelor, where we drive, uh, we drive the piano up. And the last, the last leg, it, there's so much scree that we actually have to use one of their sky tracks to like tow the truck and the piano. Um, and I love, I just kind of love the, I love that people kind of have to trek to get there. I mean, they can, you know, you can ride the chairlift up, but then you still have to hike a little ways and, or you can hike the whole mountain. Um, and then afterwards there's a dinner up on the, at, um, at the lodge up there. I think what I like about bachelor is that it's it's one of the more kind of unlikely spots um, to see a grand piano <laughs> and if there's snow which i i think there will be um people can kind of like slide on the snow with their headphones on <laughs> it's <laughs> fun um i also love um i we're going back to the south coast to uh to shore acres um coos bay charleston north bend i i do really love that area it's um, my family lived there for a while and Shore Acres is just, it's a magical state park and you can just sit kind of at the edge of this cliff and watch the waves roll in. So I'm really excited about those two places in Oregon. We'll also be down at Chrissy Field uh, on kind of the border of Oregon and California, um, which we have not yet been to. Um, and then we go off to like California and Utah and Wyoming, um, some new places there as well, which I'm pretty excited about. 
Yeah. You, when you started this out, it, it seems like it was mostly spots in Oregon, um, which would make sense for, you know, you as an Oregonian. Um, you know, a, as you mentioned at your last performance at Wallawa Lake, and the landscape has been expanding to other areas. So, I mean, on your, your schedule for this year, you've got, you know, Idaho, Wyoming, Utah, California, as you mentioned. Um, you know, I know that you all are going out to Crater Lake. I, I'm curious, you know, how far do you see this expanding? And are there are there places that you really are are dreaming of? Like, man, I've got to get out and play this particular spot. There, there are so many places in the world uh, <laughs> I, I want to play. And sometimes, like when I'm on Instagram or something, I just I'm like, oh, imagine a piano there. Or it it completely has transformed any traveling that I do because now. Like if I go on the road with Thomas and Pink Martini, I'll like, you know, do side trips and check out every possible park and imagine where the piano would look best. There are a couple of things I've always wanted to do. One is uh, to have a floating stage and put the piano up at Sparks Lake. There's so much of this, of even the Pacific Northwest that I haven't explored, but of this country. And I think when I started, I was like, oh, you know, after a couple of years, then we'll kind of move on to other places in Oregon. But still, today, seven years later, there's still so much of Oregon that I haven't seen. And so I, I feel like I could, on the one hand, just stay in Oregon and we could like continue to explore this amazing state. But most likely what will happen is we'll just continue to kind of reach out. And a lot of the way, like in most cases, the way that we go to a new, a new spot, uh, sometimes it's like, you know, I, I am scouring Google Earth and I'm like, oh, I want to go to that place. Other times there's maybe a land trust that is doing some work and they want to have in the landscape there to kind of celebrate and showcase a new acquisition or uh, a new special project that they want to raise awareness for. And so one of the kind of surprise benefits of, of kind of being in the stage now is that people are seeking out us and then I get to learn about, you know, amazing work that's being done um, in the conservation and world um, that's kind of happening all over the country. And, um, and so most likely the way that we'll kind of go into these new landscapes uh, is kind of with partners. I think it could grow in any number of ways. And at a certain point, um, you know, maybe we, we will need to have more musicians. Yeah, I saw on your upcoming show list. Have you not yet traveled to um, Joshua Tree? Is that on the list, Hunter? That is on the list. Yeah, Joshua oh. Tree is on the list, um, and Yosemite, and uh, yeah, a couple of of awesome national parks this season. Oh There'll be gosh. tiny shows, like <laughs> hundred people, but um, uh, yeah, I'm really excited about those. Oh my gosh. Well, Hunter, where can people find more information about In a Landscape if they want to come out, see a show, see if there's one kind of close by to where they are? They can go to inalandscape.org. There's just a button right there where they can click to see the full schedule. And lastly, in the spirit of the podcast, what are some of your favorite Pacific Northwest outdoor activities or adventures? I guess when you're not traveling, <laughs> playing the piano and scouting yeah. out locations, <laughs> whenever you have an ounce of free time. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, you know, one of, um, I think one of the things I like to do the most when traveling around Oregon is uh, going on the hunt for swimming holes. Uh, I love, I love finding like little, bodies of water to lay in the sun or the shade and go swimming. And um, usually like they're, you know, I guess getting to know kind of the people in, in the areas, they, they know the best, they know the best spots and they're um, <clears throat> uh, so I, I feel like that's one of the secret treasures that, uh, that I get to hang on to from this project is, is finding like great, great little swimming holes around the state. Amazing. Great time of year for it too, as we're getting into that hot season finally. So I hope you're able to go out and find some of those, uh, cool down those hands a little bit from all the piano playing. Um, and you know, Hunter, it's just such a great gift you, you're giving to all of us here in Oregon and around the West. So thanks for doing it. And thanks for coming on today to tell us all about it. 
Well, thank you uh, both so much for, for your questions and for your interest and for coming to a show. Hope to see you at another one. I will absolutely love to come to another one. Oh, Vicky, I don't know about you, but after that one performance at Willow Lake, I feel like I have just become like uh, an absolute fan of In a Landscape, and I, I am dying to see another one. Oh, yeah, me too. When uh, we were at the performance, they hand out programs, and it has this great, like, beautiful map that I believe Hunter designed, and it shows you where all the different shows will be, as well as the dates, um, you know, anywhere in the, in the few states that we uh, kind of rattled off there. And I'm just like, oh, what's next? Where can I go? Where can I travel to and see this? And I know a lot of my friends were just like, what is this? I want to go to. So I will definitely be going to another show in the future. Absolutely. I mean, I'm just looking through the summer schedule here, which um, they have on their in the landscape website, as well as in the stories that we posted on Here is Oregon and Oregon Live. And I mean, they've got stuff coming into Lithia Park and Ashland, like you said, at Mount Bachelor and Bend, Smith Rock State Park, Kelly Point Park in here in Portland, um, Washington Park in Portland, uh, Shoreacre State Park. I mean, Fort Rock, there's, there's all kinds of places that they're going. And I, I feel like you know, it, it's kind of a fun excuse to go out to some places too. Like Fort Rock is one of the like the least visited state park sites in Oregon. But mm-hmm. if you have an excuse to go out there, um, not that you necessarily need one, but if you want one, <laughs> this is a great reason to go do that. And same with yeah. Chrissy Field, another small state park site on the Oregon coast. Um, it's such a cool opportunity to see some areas of the state and the region that you might not see otherwise. And it's a really cool way to see those places, I think. Yeah. You know, you go there and you see this show and you that's just like a memory that sticks with you for the rest of your life, I'm yes. telling you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Vicky, uh, I'm excited to see another one. It sounds like you are too. And um, folks listening, if you can get out and check one out, highly recommend. I think we give a resounding recommendation here on the podcast. <laughs> 12 out shows. of 10. <laughs> <laughs> but until then... You can watch our videos on the Oregonians YouTube channel, view all of our travel and outdoors coverage on OregonLive.com slash travel, as well as HereIsOregon.com. Please leave us a rating or review if you enjoy the show. And if you want to support this podcast and our local journalism, please consider a subscription to Oregon Live. You can find details at OregonLive.com slash pod support. Also, if you're a fan of the show and are interested in potentially sponsoring it, you can get in touch with our marketing people at advertise at oregonian.com. This episode of the show was produced by me, Vicki Connor, alongside Jamie Hale and Andrew Thien. Stay safe and happy travels, everyone. Until next time, we leave you with this 10 seconds of Zen.